Good morning, everyone. <laughs> everyone uh, doing well today? So, given the circumstances, uh, I'll try to make it a little bit less uh, organized and more entertaining for, for, <laughs> for all parties involved. So, but I think we've been through things systematically enough that now I can be a little bit more uh, cartoonish, like more impressionistic. So first, um, in order to really wrap up, I want to describe to you more or less how things work. Uh, from uh, We understood this story of, hopefully, of the four-point function of conformally coupled scalars exchanging a particle of arbitrary mass. We understood uh, how the differential equation that I wrote up here, where I, instead of writing m squared minus 2, I wrote something that depends on conformal dimensions this time. So yeah, so I think we understood, hopefully we understood uh, well the dynamics of the scalar, of the scalar exchange solution. And uh, from there, it's all kinematics, really. So I don't want to bore you with kinematics. I just want to describe the qualitative features of how you go from this solution with conformally coupled scalars all the way to the final observable. Actually, there are two steps. And these two diagrams by themselves are interesting physical observables. So this is really the. So the leading four-point function during inflation is controlled by the De Sitter approximation. So this step in which uh, you change the weights of the legs from m squared equals 2 to m squared equals 0, so conformal dimension goes from, uh, from delta equals 2 to delta equals 3 in this case. So this will control the four-point function of inflation. And as I tried to emphasize earlier in the lectures, the three-point function during inflation, you should, you should think about it as a limit of this four-point function here, okay? in which one of the legs is very soft. But one thing I've been sweeping under the rug, so I might as well say it now, is that if you really took these limits, the soft limits, you would get zero here. Okay? And this is related to something that people call the Adler zero in uh, pion physics, which is the fact that if you have a massless scalar field, the mass is protected by some shift symmetry. So you have to write shift symmetric interactions. So if you take the soft limits, because you have the interaction with, interaction with a shift symmetry, there is always some gradients acting on, on, this, uh, on this scalar field. So if you were to take the soft limits, you would literally be 0. Is that clear? So there's always some d mu pi somewhere. So if you take the naive soft limits, you're going to get p mu times pi, and p is going to 0. So you literally get 0. So the way around this is to give this extra field a tiny mass, a tiny mass. And the tiny mass will make this tiny in Hubble units. And the tiny mass will make this uh, scalar lag redshift with time. So once it goes outside of the horizon, its power is not constant anymore. It has some time dependence. And that's effectively what a slow roll parameter is parametrizing for you, right? It's, it's telling you something about how far from pure Hubble expansion you are. So, so when you do that, you pay a price of epsilon. Okay? And one way of understanding why, another way of understanding why you pay the price of epsilon is that, remember that we've been arguing that, you know, when you go to these squeeze type of configurations, you do need some intermediate field around to mediate the interaction because every mode wants to leave the horizon at a certain time. So the moment that you have these hierarchies between momenta, then every mode wants to exit the horizon at a given time, right? So it, unless you have something that travels through space time mediating an interaction, you're going to inevitably suppress the signal. So now here, if we're taking one of the legs to be very soft, so we, 
no matter what we do, we generated a hierarchy, right? Because this mode here leaves the horizon way before all the other hard modes. So that's another way of understanding why the three-point function will be suppressed. It will not be order one if you write uh, order, order one or order g squared coupling constants here. You pay an extra price and the factor of slow row here is precisely accounting for this price that you're paying. Is that clear? Okay. So the three-point function in inflation is really the, so, so the four-point function in inflation equals the four-point function in DS, okay? While the three-point function in inflation equals the four-point function in DS, where one of the legs has a tiny m squared equals epsilon mass, and then you take the soft limit. All right. So again, because this, this guy leaves the horizon way before everyone else, the signal will be naturally suppressed, and the size of the suppression is precisely controlled by the mass of this uh, soft state. You can ask yourself the question, well, why, can, why don't I make everyone uh, order epsilon? But then I'm just going to generate epsilon corrections to this leading order result. So it's like running of the non Gaussianity that is already suppressed by order epsilon. So you can keep these, uh, these modes with uh, zero mass. You're going to get something non-zero. It's just that if you literally took the four-point function with everyone having zero mass and took the soft limit, you'd get zero. OK? All right. Questions about this? All right. Very good. So there is a there is a little uh, there's a little story about how you go from m squared equals two to m squared equals zero. It boils down to some differential operators. They're called weight shifting operators. So well, this is continuation here. So I'll just yeah. It's because it's a, because we have a massless scalar and we don't want to spoil inflation. We would like the potential to be relatively flat. So the way you do it in practice is you write shift symmetric interactions. So if you have these, uh, if you have these, uh, these extra fields around and you don't want them to spoil inflation by, by creating corrections that spoil you know, the flatness of the potential, the, of the classical potential. So what you want to do is you write cubic interactions that will look like this, maybe d mu phi squared sigma type of uh, interactions. So if you do that, then these, um, these diagrams will have an Adler zero. So the Adler zero is just coming from the fact that every, everywhere you see a phi, there is always a derivative acting on it. Is that clear? You look. Okay. All right. Okay, so I wanna. I don't wanna bore you with showing this uh, operator that takes you from here to here. So I'm just gonna give you some intuition for for uh, why you have to find such an operator. So the reason why we've been studying these uh, conformally coupled scalars is because their mode functions are not that complicated. So a conformally coupled scalar of wave number k has a mode function that looks like this in such a way that if I take two of them, in particular phi 1, phi 2, I get eta squared e to the i k1 plus k2 eta. So the nice thing is that even though each mode has a given wave number, in this combination, only the sum appears. So that's like the, you know, the back of the envelope way of understanding why the scalar solution can be written as a function only of u and v. 
Because U, recall, is like S over K1 plus K2, and likewise for V. So you see, the reason why K, only the combination K1 plus K2 is appearing is related to the fact that when you multiply two of these mode functions, you get only the sum. Okay, but you have two variables. There's no reason why, in general, only the sum will appear. And in fact, if you take phi, so now the massless mode function, it looks like this, 1 minus i k mod, throwing away normalization. It's not relevant to this argument. So now if I take two of them, well, then clearly because of these factors here, It's not going to be just a function of the sum, right? But, and this I'll leave as an exercise for you. You can show that this combination, d mu phi 1, d mu phi 2, which is related to the type of uh, cubic coupling that we have in mind for inflation. If you take d mu phi 1, d mu phi 2, that, that's actually equal to some operator O, well, let me call it U, U1, 2, some operator that depends on the momenta 1 and 2, acting on phi 1, phi 2. Okay? So that's great. It means that if, I were, if I'm doing the, the bulk integral now for massless scalars, Let's do scalar exchange here first. So I would have some integral. I would have some mode function phi 1, some mode function phi 2. Then the propagator for the internal particle doesn't care. OK? And uh, I write the shift symmetric coupling. So I, I have something like this, d mu phi, d mu phi, times the propagator for the internal particle of, of mass m, then d nu phi. 3, d nu, phi, 4, okay? So if this, if this um, identity is true, these are just some, some operators, okay? So for example, you're going to get something like 1 minus k1, k2 divided by k, k1 plus k2, d k1 plus... So because this only depends on k1 plus k2, you can take derivatives with respect to this variable. This is not the actual answer. I'm just giving you a cartoon of what the answer looks like. Times, I don't know, like uh, u du minus 1, for example. Okay? Because this has two derivatives, you would imagine that it's a second order differential operator. And in, in practice, it is. Okay? The actual operator doesn't matter. But there is a certain operator that will turn these uh, uh, conformally coupled scalars into, into some massless scalars, OK? So if that's true, and they only depend on momenta, and you're doing a time integral to compute this diagram, you can just write u1, 2, u3, 4, integral, phi 1, phi 2, the propagator, phi 3, phi 4, OK? That's, that's it. It's just kinematics. There's nothing fancy going on. It's just some identity between uh, this type of, uh, of bulk interactions. Okay? So that's how we, we found this, by brute force. And uh, once you go beyond the scalar type of... Um, yeah, this method is extremely inefficient, okay? but it's, uh, you know, what, it's uh, what was available at the time. And then we worked pretty hard and found a way of getting from here to massless, massless uh, scalar four-point functions. Uh, but the catch is, yeah, what do you think the catch is of, of this uh, method? Do you see something? Do you think that if I, if I found this u12 here, that I can just sprinkle u12, u34, in all of these formulas here, and I'm done. 
So I'm telling you now that phi, 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 one, two, three, four equals something like u one two, u three four of one over s of f u and v. Okay, where u one two, u three four you can figure out by solving this type of uh, this type of uh, identity. Okay. So do you think this works at any spin? Well, if I'm asking, I guess uh, you, it's not it's not too complicated to guess what the answer is. But but what do you think the problem is? So if I So this operator u12 is linking d mu phi 1, d mu phi 2 equals u12 phi 1 phi 2. Great. But you know, this is a scalar. Okay? So it's okay. Uh, I mean, if I have a scalar particle being exchanged in this type of situation, I have something like phi squared sigma well, in this situation here, I have something like d mu phi squared sigma. But now, once you go up in spin, if you go to spin 1, for example, it's, you can't just write a scalar, right? You need to write a current. So you need to write something like d mu phi. Uh, let me write something like, like this. d mu d nu phi d mu phi bar minus complex conjugates. Okay? So it has a floating index. And then you contract this with sigma nu. Well, here you would get something like phi d mu phi bar minus complex conjugates. Sigma nu, sigma mu. Okay, so now you need to worry about each component, the i components and the zero components of the currents. And it turns out that, so the same way that in this story here, this part of the answer is taking care of the i components, this part of the answer is taking into account the zero components. There will be a different u12 operator here at every value of helicity, okay? So that's the bad news. So you have to, it's a pain, pain in the neck, and you find a U12 operator here, a U12 operator here, and uh, yeah, you can imagine that it doesn't, it's not very practical. Okay, but then once we found this, it turns out that people in conformal field theory already worked this out, and it's trivial for them to, to, do, to do it in general. So I, can't, I was going to tell you how this is done, but it's really all about kinematics. So just believe me, there are a very simple way of figuring out all of these operators. Okay? But it's kind of technical, so I'd, I'd rather do something else. But the, the bottom line is that there will be some operators And let me just, so if you have, uh, if you have phi, 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 phi for a spin one exchange, which has this form, pi one duv plus pi naught delta u acting on f divided by s. If you go from here to massless scalars, phi, 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 there will be some operator u12, u34 that acts on the top spin component. So I'm going to put a 1 here, a u12, u34 that acts on the bottom spin component here. And the same story 
I'm not going to repeat the formula. Okay? So there's going to be a similar story for spin 2. Okay? So if you understand the, the, this diagram for conformally coupled scalars, qualitatively not much changes other than this fact that I was telling you that there is some shift symmetry. So the soft limit of these correlators actually vanishes. Okay? So when you translate, by the way, when you translate this to the gravitational fluctuations, when you remember that in the first lecture we did some Higgsing, right? We went from the scalar sector and uh, the, the scalar fluctuations got eaten by the metric. Right? So when you do that, you, even in the soft limit, a little piece of the answer survives from this gauge transformation. Okay. So these are called inflationary consistency conditions. They're just like soft limits in, uh, in uh, pion physics or yeah, it's like soft pion theorems or soft graviton theorems. So there's been a whole recent literature about, about soft theorems and there is a completely analogous story here in cosmology, okay? But in terms of these interactions, it boils down to this Adler zero story that everything is coupled in a shift symmetric way. So if you take a, a soft limit, the correlation function vanishes. Is that clear? All right. So now we're going to have a little bit of a break because this looks very complicated. But actually, you already solved the equation for the scalar solution. And now you can plug in whatever mess you want. In particular, if you, if you take uh, this solution and you take mass equals zero, spin equals two, and you just sprinkle a bunch of derivatives on the solution, you get uh, the tri-spectrum of graviton exchange, okay? And uh, this tri-spectrum of graviton exchange was computed in some heroic efforts using the standard method like um, around 2008. And, uh, well, you can judge for yourself. You can, I can give you the references. And uh, this is very much more economical than uh, the, the naive uh, bulk perturbation theory way of doing it. So it's great. But now we know the answer for any mass and spin. So you can just dial up the spin, dial up the mass. You know the, the scalar solution. You feed it here, and you get the formula for the any tri-spectrum you wish. And I, I, showed you this, um, I showed you this plot of how the, the tri-spectrum works for scalar exchange, where we had this EFT. We have color, but um, yeah, not every chalk works. Yeah, so we have this EFT part. And then we have this particle production part. But the only thing we were dialing here was, you know, the relative ratio of the various momenta. So here I'm just shrinking like some diagonal. But what you can do now, if you want to do spin spectroscopy, you can dial the relative angle. So, so now you, you can imagine like cutting here and taking these two triangles and just uh, changing the relative angle between the two triangles. So if you have an extra axis in which uh, you take, you know, the two triangles are precisely on the, in the same plane. And as you move in this direction, maybe the other triangle goes away from this plane. I'm not sure that my picture is very clear, but well, it looks obvious to me, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, so it's, it's like a menu, right? So it's, someone gives you a menu, but it's a triangular, so you open the menu, it's like this, and then anyway, so that, this angle, as you dial this angle, you should see at any slice here, I mean, it's more prominent around here, but really at any slice, if you, if you keep the geometry more or less fixed and you dial up and down the angle, you should see some Legendre polynomial behavior, okay? And the degree of the Legendre polynomial 
will tell you about the spin. Spin. Okay. Where this is theta. Okay? So that's how you do particle spectroscopy in cosmology. So now we have ex precisely the, 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 the you know, detailed expressions for how to compute any four-point function, any mass, any spin. Okay? So now there is a nice simplification that happens when you're interested only in the bispectrum, only in the three-point function. And the simplification is the following. Maybe I mentioned this in earlier lectures, but let's go through it again. I have to, so you see, I can exchange a spinning particle because there is orbital angular momentum between these uh, two scalar fluctuations. So even though they are scalars, they can, you know, ro spin around each other and produce angular momentum to, pair pr to particle produce or to couple consistently to a spinning particle. But the moment I take one of the legs to be very soft, this guy doesn't have a dense partner anymore, right? So effectively, the only thing that you can exchange is the longitudinal part of a spinning particle, okay? So it means that if, I'm, if the only thing I care about is the three-point function, at least we, ha we get a break, we can forget about the top helicity stuff and only focus on the, on the longitudinal part. Is that clear? So that's very nice. Uh, but then you would say, well, but then if I have graviton exchange, which is the minimal amount of non-Gaussianity that any model could generate, because again, we always have gravity switched on, so at the very least, you're going to have graviton exchange going on here. Then uh, are we going to get zero? And the answer is no. Remember that the longitudinal part, even though there is no propagating piece coming from, yeah. even though there is no propagating piece coming from a graviton exchange, you still have to solve the constraints equations of GR. And you, because you're, you're looking at a profile at late times in which you have particles, these particles have to have generated a Newtonian potential earlier on. It's not like you can just put planets in and all of a sudden they are attracting each other, okay? So the planets were always around and the Newtonian force between them was always around from the moment you prepare initial data, okay? So that's why there's no causality problem. And Therefore, if you look at this diagram here, even for graviton exchange, you will get a non-trivial three-point interaction. It's just coming from the Newtonian potential between these uh, three different legs. Okay? Is that clear? Yeah. No, but, that, but that's, okay. Um, sorry, I'm also sleepy. First question. Uh, sorry, what was the first question? <laughs> Ah, right, 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 sorry, sorry, now, now I remember. So, so this, 
again, uh, let's go back to the timeline of the universe. So this is just a theory that generates initial conditions for the universe. So here you have some statistics of primordial seeds. That's why we are around, right? The universe is not entirely homogeneous, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But it all happens through gravitational collapse of some initial seeds that are distributed random, not randomly, but through, with some statistics. And that's the statistics that we're trying to compute here. So this period generates uh, you know, certain initial conditions and the observable are these uh, correlation functions of the Newtonian potential right at the beginning of the hot Big Bang. Okay, so we have a specific time slice that you know Big Bang cosmology controls for us, and you should think of this uh, horizontal slice here as the slice in which I set up those initial conditions. Okay, so the true observable are I don't know like temperature fluctuations or galaxy counts or density contrasts, and I correlate those things. And that's how you see the the acoustic bumps in the CMB and or the power spectrum of of matter fluctuations, but that's late universe physics, and you always trace things back to what was happening in the initial conditions, okay? So that, that's the object that we're trying to compute. So these things are imprinted at a very early universe, and because of causality, a big part of it doesn't get washed out. So this is related to your second question. So, you know, the universe is old, but not that old, so dark matter hasn't been able to traverse a humongous distance. So correlations that have like a big enough wave number, if they were, if they were set up at the beginning of uh, the hot Big Bang cosmology, their imprints are still around, okay? So all the structure on the universe, like, uh, you know, CMB, uh, photons and, and uh, dark matter and so on is just tracing those initial conditions. There is some amount of gravitational evolution that you have to take into account. In the CMB, it's very weak. The large scale structure is more complicated, but in the end, the whole point of why you trust these methods is precisely because there hasn't been enough time for the late universe to wash out these, uh, these initial correlations, okay? Any more questions? All right. Okay, so, um, okay, I, I was saying, so if you look at any higher spin exchange, a good piece of news is that for the three-point function, you just need to focus on the, on the longitudinal part. So if you go to the slow row calculation, the calculation that done by Juan Maldacen in 2002, he gets some minimal level of non-Gaussianity from the three-point function. It's epsilon suppressed for the, now we understand why, because what he was really co computing, well, he, he wasn't clear, I, he probably didn't know at the time, but he, he was, what was being computed was this four-point function in this soft limit. So that, that's why the result is epsilon suppressed, okay? And, you get some funny looking cubic interaction term, but it's really coming from integrating out the, the Newtonian potential between these uh, different particles, okay? So if you take this uh, formula that I wrote here and you feed in the solution for uh, delta equals uh, three, remember that uh, it's like delta U minus two F equals uv divided by u plus v. This is the scalar exchange solution when the exchange particle is massless. So that's what, what's going to be relevant for the graviton. So you see that because there is a delta u minus 2 here, you already tossed at this helicity, you already tossed the propagating poles. Remember the propagation is related to poles in u plus 1 and v plus 1, right? That was the discussion we had at the end of last lecture. So, but still, you do have something. It's not like this is zero. You still have some level of, uh, of non-Gaussianity coming from this, from this uh, contacts like Coulomb or Newtonian potential. So if you take this and you feed it 
into these weight shifting formulas, you get on the nose mod the sentence answer. Okay? But now you know the three point function for whatever you want gravitons, any mass, any spin. You just take these formulas, you change a little bit the, the, the scalar function that you're feeding in, and you get the bispectrum. Okay? So that's it. So all the dynamics was inside of this formula and everything else is kinematic. So that's the power of doing things in quasi de Sitter, that you don't have to do any more work. Everything else just follows from, from pure kinematics. Okay? So that's, I think that that's where I'm going to stop for, for scalar fluctuations. And then I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to tell you about external spinning particles. And I'll probably spend a lot of time doing things in flat space because this is like such important stuff that even if you don't care about cosmology, you should know what I'm going to tell you the next, uh, I don't know, half hour or so. So are, are there any questions, any more questions related to, to scalar fluctuations? So now, in principle, you can compute any four and three point function in slow row inflation, any mass, any spin at three level. Okay, so with this machinery, you should be able to do that. The only freedom that you have left over is in the overall size of the signal. Of course, we can crank up and down the, the signal. But um, the actual shape, we found the whole family. There's nothing else. Unless you go to models that don't respect the sitter symmetries or are not slow roll. Okay. Questions? I think I can. Right now I can't, but uh, yeah, I think it's. <laughs> I, I, I'm confident that one day we can, but we don't understand. I think that the main barrier is understanding cutting rules, and we don't understand cutting rules. And there, there are partial results at loops, but even simple things like how is the. Is there a basis like bubble, triangle, box, th those kinds of things? We don't know yet. Even the, uh, the Charles and Lehman representation of the propagator, I would say it's not well understood in, uh, in, these, uh, co in these coordinates that are useful for inflation. There are papers written on it, but all in embedding space. So uh, you would need to like know how to break these things down for, for the coordinates that are useful to cosmology. And I think actually, okay, now that you mention it, let me, let me uh, point out that loops are a Pandora box in uh, the sitter space. So if you Google loops in the sitter, uh, let there be demons. So there, there will be like all sorts of controversy. People don't understand if the loop corrections become big, if they become small, if uh, they are negligible, if they are important. So people claim that there could be infrared effects that spoil the three level results. Some people even think that they might be so important they actually back react and destroy the sitter space. So if that's true, it's an amazing conclusion because it means you don't need to write a scalar potential. Just quantum corrections take care of uh, screening the cosmological constant for you. So some people say it's all fine. The loop corrections are small, tiny logarithmic corrections. So I, I think that in some models, people can understand this question, but the jury is still out on, on, on like a fully general understanding of cosmological fluctuations, even at one loop. So everyone has an opinion, but nobody uh, has a, yeah, <laughs> an actual, like, really, really strong handle on how to tackle these questions. All right. Very good. So now we're going to do spin, spinning external particles. All right. So 
who, uh, who has never heard of spinor helicity variables here? Or who has heard of spinor helicity variables here? Okay, very good. So we are going to go through, like, I think one of the most beautiful pieces of, uh, of theoretical physics, which is the inevitability of the physical loss at long distances. Okay, so if you study consistent scattering of massless particles in four dimensions, then you're kind of cornered into the laws of physics as we know them. Okay, so I think that that's a pretty sweet result. So I'll show you that the 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 only, the, the only requirements are are you know you want your amplitude so you amplitudes so we're in flat space now okay and then hopefully depending on how we go with time I'll tell you how the story works in the sitter but let, let's just uh, review how it works in flat space so amplitudes must be compatible with unitarity and Lorentz invariance. And that's, and that's pretty hard, okay? And they must be local. So they have to, well, I'm just repeating Nima's mantra. They have to factorize, factorize, factorize. So you want things to factorize correctly. And your building blocks are Lorentz invariants. They're essentially unique if you want to study uh, scattering amplitudes at long distances that leave imprints at long distances. By leaving imprints at long distances, I mean they leave poles. Okay? If there are no poles, you go to very long distances, the scattering amplitude vanishes. So you want to study scattering amplitudes with poles. The problem is sometimes there are just too many poles and uh, either you have to work hard to make sure that the poles are only where they should be or the amplitude simply doesn't exist and then you can't write a consistent theory. So I want to show you how this story works. So this is very nice because if you don't succeed, then you discover the no-go result. But if you do succeed, you actually compute the amplitude. And that's, uh, that's no easy task. In, in uh, famous example is GR. Okay? So the four-point scattering amplitude in GR is notoriously complicated. The cubic vertex, if you're a hard worker, you can get it in like maybe a couple of days. And you feel great, then you have the three points. You, you have the Feynman diagrams, and you feel smart because you're summing up all the Feynman diagrams with the cubic vertex. You know about the equivalence principle, so you write S, T, and U exchange channels. S plus T plus U. But now you, you find out that actually you're missing a context term. And good luck. Okay, so I, I, I encourage you to, well, you can look up how the, the wits uh, computed this uh, context term. And uh, yeah, it ain't pretty, I'll tell you that. It's, um, yeah, I don't know how many terms it has, uh, but a lot. Okay. So this, uh, this on shell method, uh, so this is a simple example. Of course, and Nima's lectures were all about all of these amazing structures that appear if you think on shell. So this is a simple example, and it already shows how powerful uh, this uh, way of thinking is. Okay, so these were Feynman diagrams. And this is bad, okay, bad news. So you're in trouble. If you have to do it this way, you're in trouble. So let's, let's try to think about um, how to classify three-point couplings, three-point scattering amplitudes. Sorry. So 
So these will be our building blocks because we're only interested in massless particles. So we want, at four points, there can only be three sources of uh, singularities, either S, T, or U channel ex uh, uh, singularities. And if you have a certain four-point scattering amplitude, and you send one of the Mandel's thumbs to zero, say send S to zero, for example, then it better factorize into something like this, okay? Where this state in the middle is uh, to be determined. So first of all, we want to understand three-point three point scattering amplitudes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I need to say one thing about this uh, spinner helicity variable. So. But first. A short rant about polarization vectors. So polarization vectors are figments of your imagination, okay? So they are, they are a crutch, and in particular, they are not Lorentz vectors. So I learned this from Nima, and it's like shocking how important this is and how much we don't know. We don't learn about this in textbooks. So polarization vectors are not Lorentz vectors. So if you do a boost, the Lorentz vector will change by lambda mu nu, epsilon nu, right? If you do a boost on a polarization vector, it doesn't change like a Lorentz vector would change. Okay? So if you do, if you do a boost on a, Lorentz vec on a polarization vector, because it depends on P, it turns out that depending on how you parameterize your, your polarization vector, it will change by, you know, your... your standard, um, your standard Lorentz transformation plus something proportional to P mu, okay? So that's why people say, wow, the amplitudes need to be gauge invariant and blah, blah, blah. It's to take into account this fact that actually the polarization vectors are not Lorentz vectors. Because if they were, you would take like some Lorentz tensor, like any Feynman diagram is, any Feynman diagram is a good Lorentz tensor. So you have mu1, mu2, ta ta ta, and then you just contract it. P1. You'd contract it with uh, polarization vectors, and you'd go home. What's the big deal? I can write any scattering amplitude. It's not a, it's not a problem. It's scalar, Lorentz invariant. It's great, very easy. But the problem is that these are not Lorentz vectors, okay? So it turns out that it's much more complicated to get really Lorentz invariant amplitudes. And if you really wanna keep polarization vectors around, then you have to write a bunch of Lorentz tensors you contract the, contract the various Lorentz tensors with these epsilons, and then you impose gauge invariance. Okay? So gauge invariance in this context is just a way to get a Lorentz scalar at the end of the day. Okay? So that's the, that's the key point, that amplitudes are Lorentz scalars. And epsilon mu is not Lorentz vector, okay? So we're going to try to, because three-point scattering amplitudes are so constrained, we're going to try to just write them without making any reference to Lorentz uh, to Lorentz vector, to polarization vectors, okay? okay. 
actually it's so constraining that if you if you really wrote like um, like a scattering amplitude with uh, lo with uh, your polarization vectors and you try to solve for the polarization vectors in terms of the momenta you'd, you'd get zero okay <laughs> so you need to do a, there's a little bit of a trick that you need to use to get something non zero for the three point scattering amplitudes and the trick is to complexify the momenta so if your momenta are real if the momenta are real then the scattering amplitudes are actually zero okay if there are spinning particles of course for for scalars you can write a g but this is the only counter example but if you have spinning particles for real momenta the 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 three point scattering amplitude is zero so the solution to get something non zero is to complexify complexify the momenta and then you you get something something interesting okay now the last thing i need to i need to tell you about is about these spinner helicity variables okay so this is a parenthesis So if I have a, a massless particle, I have a, a four momentum associated to it, and it satisfies p mu squared equals zero. Okay. It means that if I were to write it in a, in a, in a two by two matrix, like a p mu, if I dot it with a Pauli matrices like this, sigma mu, I always get the indices wrong, so a a dots which is really just something like p naught plus i p z oh, sorry p, p naught plus p z p x plus i p y p x minus i p y minus p naught plus p z something like this then p squared equals to the determinant of this matrix okay so I'm just organizing the form momentum into a two by two matrix and if the momentum squares to zero the determinants of this uh, of this matrix p a a dot is zero so it has lower rank in particular it means that you can write p a a dot as the product of, a, of a, a line times a column, okay? Lambda, lambda bar, a dot. Okay? So these are called spinner helicity variables. And they are very nice for, for a variety of reasons. First of all, if uh, the momenta are real, then lambda and lambda bar are related to each other by a reality condition. But now we, we want to relax this condition. We take lambda and lambda bar to be independent. So now the momenta are complex, but it's still true that they square to zero. Okay. Second thing is that there is, uh, there is uh, some sort of uh, symmetry in the sense that if I rescale lambda by a phase, I can rescale lambda bar by the opposite phase, and uh, I get back the same, the same form momentum. Okay? In other words, if I send lambda to e to the i theta lambda, and lambda bar, say that lambda bar is, is the complex conjugate by e to the minus i theta, or it doesn't matter, send lambda to e to the i theta lambda, lambda bar to e to the minus i theta lambda bar, p remains unchanged, okay? And this, this uh, phase ambiguity is actually counting helicity. It's related to helicity of, uh, of, your, of your massless particles, okay? So if I look at uh, 
scattering amplitudes of particles of given helicity, the amplitudes are going to have some weight with respect to these uh, phase rotations that keep the form momentum fixed. So that's a good way of figuring out, like it's a very helpful way of figuring out what the, what the three-point scattering amplitude will look like. Actually, it will uniquely fix the three-point scattering amplitude. So lambda to e to the i theta lambda, lambda bar to e to the minus i theta lambda bar. It's some symmetry that is related to helicity weight. Okay, And because this is a spinner, it makes sense to assign to lambda so this I always get wrong, so sorry, the literature will probably be the opposite of what I say. But uh, lambda, I, I assign, say, weight plus a half. Lambda bar, I will assign weight minus a half, okay, because these are spinners. Okay, so it's uh, related to units of angular momentum along the direction of motion of the, of the spinning particle. The final, uh, so, so this is just a, a nice way of uh, taking into account helicity weights, okay? So it's uh, so the amplitude is going to be Lorentz invariant, but it's going to be covariance in these helicity weights and uh, and the overall weights that you pick when you do this uh, type of uh, helicity-like transformations is uh, related to the external helicities of the states that you're scattering. So I'm going to show you a few examples in a second, and then it's going to be obvious what I mean. The last, uh, the last thing that I need to say about this is, um, is that at three points, something special was happening. So remember that these are all massless particles. So P1 squared equals P2 squared equals P3 squared equals 0. So in particular, if you were to write down something like p1 dot p2, then it would be like, you know, p1 plus p2 plus p3 equals 0. Therefore, p1 squared plus 2 p1 dot p2 plus p2 squared equals p3 squared. But this is 0, this is 0, this is 0. So any naive Lorentz invariance you try to write will give you, will give you 0. Okay. So that's the bad news. But now uh, these uh, variables tell you that there is something else you can do. If you keep the lambda and lambda bar independent from each other, there is still something that you can write down that is compatible with, uh, with uh, Lorentz symmetry and non-zero, okay? So, <laughs> uh, so what is that thing? So p1 mu, p2 mu, the four, the 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 dot products between uh, between um, two four momenta. If you go to these variables and you use some Pauli matrix uh, technology, it turns out that it's proportional to the following. So recall that there is some SL2R group related to the Pauli matrices. So the Lorentz group. This is too technical, you can, you can ask me, but it's just that the, the Lorentz group, so eta mu nu, the matrix that you use to contract indices, in this uh, space of these A and A dots, you can replace it by two epsilon symbols. So there's going to be some epsilon AB, epsilon A dot, B dot, where epsilon is the standard levi civita epsilon symbol. So if you, if you took this expression here, 
and you soaked all the indices with Pauli matrices, you, you can check that you're going to get back the standard uh, uh, metric of, um, of Lorentz um, space, just the stem minus plus 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 metric. Okay? So it means that now I can dot these uh, lambdas with themselves using the epsilon symbol, and I can dot the lambda bars with the epsilon dot, with dot symbol. In particular, if you look at these uh, dot products here between two different momenta, you're going to get something, I don't know, like maybe minus 2. Don't quote me on this. Uh, epsilon a, b, uh, lambda 1, a, lambda 2, b, times epsilon a dot, b dot, lambda bar 1, a dot, lambda bar 2, B dot, okay? So because these dot products will appear everywhere, they're dot products between um, polarization um, spinner helicity variables, uh, we're going to introduce a, a little bit of notation. So again, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it's not what the usual convention, but I'm going to call this angle brackets. And uh, it's 1, 2 because I'm dotting the, the spinners 1 and 2. And this square brackets because I'm dotting, I'm dotting, doing a dot product of spinners with dotted indices. So is it the opposite in general or is it, that's correct? Oh, oh. oh it's 50-50, right? So, <laughs> all right. So, so the, the, the P1.P2 is minus 2 times 1, 2, one two, okay. So if I if I have a if I have a so you should play with this at home. You take any known momentum and you write it in this uh, matrix form, and you figure out that there is a way of rewriting the matrix as a product of a, a line and a co or a column and a line, lambda and a lambda bar, and then you can see that if you take two known momenta and you take their dot products, you can write it in terms of these. Uh, dot products that acts only within the lambdas times this dot products that acts only within the lambda bars, okay? So now we'll see that there is slight, some slight hope for wiggle room. So I have P1 mu plus P2 mu plus P3 mu equals zero. And then we go to these variables. So this means that lambda one Lambda bar one, a. I'm probably messing up with the indices, but lambda two, lambda bar two, lambda three. Now notice something nice: the 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 four dimension, the four dot, the dot product using eta is symmetric, but each of these dot products are, are anti-symmetric because they're dot products between, well, involving the epsilon symbol, okay? So in particular, it means that if I take a dot product uh, of uh, any guy with, uh, with himself, I get zero. And now we're going to see why three points scattering in this language is so constraining. So let's dot uh, this equation here with uh, lambda 1, so I get 1, 2, lambda bar 2 a dot plus 1, 3, lambda bar a dot equals 0. In particular, it means that lambda bar 2 is proportional to lambda bar 3, right? this equation here. So if lambda bar 2 is proportional to lambda bar 3, so if lambda bar 2 is proportional to lambda bar 3, then it implies that 2, 3, is zero, 
right? Because if you write lambda 2 dotted with lambda 3 is some number times lambda 2 dotted with lambda 2, which is 0, because it's anti-symmetric. And you can repeat the same game by dotting uh, with uh, some other, uh, like, lambda brackets around, OK? So if you repeat the same game, you get 1, 2 equals 0, and 1, 3 equals 0, OK? So it looks like you're in trouble. All square brackets are 0. But there is a hidden assumption. What's the hidden assumption? Hmm? That's right. So the, the hidden assumption to prove that these are proportional to each other is that the angle brackets are not 0. Okay? So if the angle brackets are a non zero, then all square brackets are zero. And vice versa. Okay? If the square brackets are not zero, then all the angle brackets are zero. So that's why you see so why this is too restrictive, because it's always a product of an angle and a square brackets and you you're screwed, right, uh, one way or another. But now if you relax this condition that the, the angle and square brackets are related to each other, you can write expressions involving only angle brackets or only square brackets, and they'll be compatible with Lorentz symmetry. Okay? They'll be complex, so these scattering amplitudes were not going to be observable in like, uh, for real momenta, but it's still useful, a useful stepping stone to get the actual real four-point scattering amplitudes. Okay? So now we're ready to write down three-point scattering amplitudes. So recall that these uh, brackets, they carry helicity weight. And uh, the only piece of information I have from, from spinning particles is the momentum which is encoded in this lambda and lambda bar, and the helicity. So we want to write something that is Lorentz invariant, meaning it only involves these brackets, and helicity covariant, meaning that we'll pick up a uh, phase rotation that is counting the spins or the helicity weights of every particle. OK? All right. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to do that now. <laughs> and we're going to see something special happening. All right. So let's take uh, let's take a simple example first. <laughs> One, two, three. Helicity weight a half. Helicity weight a half, uh, and they have helicity plus for example. OK? So, I'm, I'm so recall that now I re ah, OK, so lambdas have uh, positive helicity weights. Lambda bars have negative helicity weights. OK? So now we're scattering two spinners. With, so the helicity weight is a half with a scalar. Okay? Very the, the, the simplest. The simplest thing beyond the three scalars. Okay? So we have to write something that will carry helicity weights plus one half on particle one and plus one half particle two. Okay? So what can you possibly write? Uh, actually, uh, what can you possibly write that carries, that only involves brackets, that carries weights plus one in the lambda one and weight plus one in lambda two? and weight 0 on particle 3. OK. 
this shouldn't be very complicated. Do you agree that this is uh, an acceptable answer? It, it carries weight plus. So if I rescale the momentum one, the lambda one picks a phase, one unit of phase. Particle two picks another unit of phase. So then I have these guys here with the correct helicity weights. Okay? There's nothing. Mm. Is there anything else? Yeah. What about this? What's the problem with this one? It looks okay, right? I rescale the momenta. Now they are downstairs, but they have a negative weight. So it has the same weight. As, uh, this is the right answer, okay? So just a hint. So what's wrong with, uh, what, what's wrong with this one here? There's something funny about this one. Because if I, if I now send the momenta back to the real sheet, so the, the angle brackets are going to go to zero because the square brackets are already zero. And there's a reality condition that will relate these guys to, uh, to the square brackets that are already zero. So if I go to the real sheet, then this goes to zero, no problem. But this one is blowing up, OK? So the, the claim is that there is no local Lagrangian that will give rise to this type of, uh, to this type of uh, of three-point scattering amplitude. So there's a little bit of locality that you have to put in to get the, to get the right answer. But that's it. You put a coupling constant here, you're done. Okay. So now you computed the three-point scattering amplitude between two spinners and a scalar. Okay. Let's do one example that's slightly more complicated. Let's do now three spin one particles but all of same weights okay one two three and uh, maybe let's do equal spin okay spin s okay. so what can i write down integer okay. actually yeah integer so what can I write down it shouldn't be if you understood this is this is this one clear so what can you write down here everyone has the same weight you need s units of spin let's do it for spin one S equals 1. So the, every time you see one of these, you have a one half units, right? So, so you got weight one half for this, one half for this. But now you need weight one for all of them. So what do, what do you do? Yes. Okay, so this this will do. Okay, that's it. This uh, for for the case of uh, spin one is coming from some f cubed term in the bulk. Okay, but uh, I've just wrote down the scattering amplitude for free. You don't need to work hard. And actually, in fact, for any spin now, so what do I do? So now you know the three points scattering amplitude at any value of the spin. Okay. Now let's do one more example, and then life is going to get a little bit interesting. There's going to be a new feature. Let's study this example here. One, two. Three plus plus minus. Okay, and let's do spin equals one. So now you need um, 
units of, um, you know, units plus one for these two guys and units minus one for this guy. You'd be tempted to try to build something with square brackets for this guy, angle brackets for these guys, but you can't because you either have angle or square brackets, okay? So, well, do you, you given the, you know, that we're tired, um, I just tell you the, the answer. Like, if you really want to do it, you would put like 1, 2 to power 1, 2, 3, power 2, 3, 1, power 3, and then solve like a small system of equations to match all of the necessary helicity weights. But this is the answer. 1, 2 cubed divided by 2, 3, 3, 1. Okay? So this is the answer. And now, you might be worried about the fact that these uh, guys are downstairs because of this example, but there is a key difference. So there are more brackets upstairs than downstairs. So when I send the, the brackets to zero, this guy is beating the fact that these two guys are going to zero, so this is still okay. okay? If you now were to invert it and use the, angle bra the square bracket expression, you get two guys upstairs, one guy downstairs cubed, so that would blow up. So that one you throw away, okay? For any spin, you get S. And now this spells a little bit of trouble. You should, be, you start, you should start to get, become a little bit worried because there are these guys downstairs, so it means that sometimes if you arrange the kinematics uh, correctly, you might get poles. Okay, so you want the amplitude to factorize. When it factorizes, it needs to factorize into products of three point scattering amplitudes. But the three point scattering amplitudes will come with extra poles. Even though it's already factorizing, there will be extra poles inducing by these uh, structures. And uh, that's already a hint that you might run into trouble once you start cranking up this spin here. Because you only have S, T, and U channels, and you can only have simple poles in each one of them. So if you, have, if you go to the S channel, and you see an amplitude factorizing with denominators where things can blow up, if you go to the T or the U channel, that's fine. You might still have a chance. But if the spin is very high, you might get too high of a power of the T and the U channel singularities. And then there is no local physics that can come in and save the day. So that's already telling you that if the spin is too high, it might be impossible. And alas, it is impossible for a spin, in fact, greater than two. That's essentially the reason. So you see an issue, even in the three-point scattering amplitude, these things here, if you were to write the expression in terms of polarization vectors, you wouldn't see it. It would look like some momenta contracted with polarization vectors. But now, this, uh, go, using these variables pays off because you see already that there is an issue. There are these extra poles. They're going to come and bite you. Okay, so they're going to put some tight constraints on, on the allowable objects. Okay? All right. So now let's try to construct, let's try to construct uh, scattering amplitudes using these uh, building blocks. So first of all, if I have uh, these building blocks that don't have poles, then I'm pretty much safe, right? If I have, if I have something that factorizes, I just write, you know, a left amplitude doesn't have any poles times 1 over s times the right amplitude doesn't have any poles, I'm done. The real trouble will come if I try to build four point scattering amplitudes involving these these types of objects, okay, with, with poles. So these are the ones that are uh, tricky. So then you might say, oh, what's the big deal then? I just focus on amplitudes that have this type of structure. They don't have poles downstairs. But you see, you have a lot of brackets upstairs. So if you write something 1 over s, a lot of brackets upstairs, 
it, it's not really leaving much, uh, much power at low energies, right? Because low energies, everything is going to zero. So you'd say, oh, I'm leaving a long distance force at long energies because I'm sending all energy scales to zero. There is a Mandelstam downstairs, so things are, there's still like non-trivial correlations or, or scattering at long distances. But these guys here are killing you, okay? So if you care about spin five scattering amplitudes, you can construct them, but they leave no interesting imprints at long distances because you have these building blocks and the amplitude will die, die, will die off. So, I mean, you have massless particles, but they're not doing the job that massless particles are supposed to do, which is to mediate long range forces, okay? So you do wanna use something that has these, uh, these types of uh, uh, scattering amplitudes that leave some, at least give you a fighting chance of leaving an imprint at long distances, okay? But the price you pay is that it's hard. You, there will be some constraints. So let's see how the... When, uh, when, uh, when am I... Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell the story. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me let me uh, let me tell you the cartoon of uh, of how this works. So let's study a scattering amplitude. So now let's try to build a, a, a theory of uh, of. Um, theory of a spin s particle. And now you study this type of scattering amplitude, one, two, say minus, minus, three, four, okay, plus, plus. So if spin equals zero, then no problem, right? Because there's not even, not even any helicity weights that you need, to, you need to assign. You can just write down one over S plus one over T plus one over U, maybe with a G squared up front here. It's phi cube theory, the one Nima has been telling you guys about. So that's no, no problem. It factorizes correctly on the S channel. So on the S channel, you get product of three-point scattering amplitudes. The T channel, G times G, and, and the U channel, I always have trouble drawing the U channel. Yeah. Something like this, okay? Because there's a G, there's no extra pole. So this is, okay, this is an example that's still interesting because it leaves imprints at long distances, but uh, three-point coupling is boring, so there is no constraint. Now if you go to uh, spin one, it's already a little bit interesting. So let's see how this works. <laughs> if you take one minus two, let's go to the S channel. Okay, go to the S channel, one over S, this S is Mandelstam, and the only particle on the spectrum is this particle of spin one, so I'm exchanging this particle here, three plus, four plus, and then uh, because it's plus plus minus, or well, minus minus plus is gonna be the same story with angle brackets replaced by square brackets. One, two. Okay, so that's gonna be, you're gonna have here on the left, uh, this three point scattering amplitude with one minus two minus and the intermediate particle. The intermediate particle must have helicity plus because of angular momentum conservation is gonna come out here with helicity minus from uh, if you take all the momenta to be incoming. 
and you're going to have i minus 3 plus 4 plus. So you're going to get something that looks like this, 1 over s times uh, uh, 1, 2 cubed divided by 1 intermediate, 2 intermediate times 3, 4 cubed divided by 3 intermediate, 4 intermediate. And that's, that's the, the, you should sniff trouble, okay? So now, if you massage this spinner expression, and this is what I'm not going to show you how to do, but if you massage the, the, um, the spinner expression, you're going to get something like brackets upstairs divided by S T. Okay? So some of these brackets cancel with stuff upstairs, but two brackets survive. And if you do a little bit of kinematics, you see that even though you're in the S channel, you see a T channel singularity. Mm. So you can't just write the S channel and go home. You have to go to the T channel and make sure that the amplitude is correctly factorizing. That's the problem. You see? So these poles here conspire to generate a T, a Mandelstam T. And now you must go to the T channel and make sure you get a residue that is compatible with the... With, so you see that now you have to write an amplitude that when you go to the S channel, gives you this formula with three-point coupling here, three-point coupling here. And then you see that there's a T channel pole. So now you have to write also an object that even though it has this S channel singularity, also has a T channel singularity. And in the T channel, it better factorize correctly also. So we go to the T channel. Go to the T channel. Boom, boom, boom. One, uh, three times one over T, two, four. You repeat this exercise three points, three points. So three points, uh, one uh, minus plus. So this must be minus. This is plus minus plus so now you're going to get uh, one three cubes divided by one well let me call intermediate tilde because it's not the same momentum it's p1 plus p3 times one over t times uh, maybe four intermediates yeah, that's, ah, sorry, it should be one intermediate here, one intermediate, one, three, intermediate, yes, okay, four intermediates, uh, pa, 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 pa. four, two, intermediate, Cubed. Okay. So I think that this is correct. And, and now, right. And, and now you, you have 1 over t again. You massage this, and you get something with 1 over t u. Ah. So now you must go to the U channel and repeat the, the same exercise. Okay, so, so you go to the S, T, and U channel. You, you, you massage things a bit. And then now there's the last, the last crucial thing, which is you already fixed the three-point coupling constants. Okay? So all of these are going to have the same three-point coupling constant appearing. 
because there's one vertex minus minus plus, one vertex minus plus plus. So you're going to have, you know, G, even if you dial the Gs differently, you can't, but okay. Even if you dial them differently, they're going to always appear together. So you're going to get G1, G2, or G squared. So there's always uh, the same G squared appearing in all of these. Okay. So the tricky thing is that the residues, not just the, the amplitude needs to factorize correctly, the residues need to be the same. Okay. So you, you can write something that looks like CS divided by ST plus C. This is the S channel. The T channel, now you go to the U channel, there's an SU. And then you try to match residues, okay? And if you try to do that, if you try to do that, I'm, I'm being impressionistic, but this is roughly correct. Then if you try to match residues, then you go to the S channel, you get this is blowing up, but this is also blowing up. And S plus T plus U must add up to zero but you're already at S equals zero, so T equals minus U. So you get CS minus CU equals G squared. If you factor out G squared, equals one, okay? If I put the G squared up front here. Is that clear? I go to the S channel, these two guys contribute with a one over T up front because S plus T plus U is zero and I'm already looking at S equals zero. Okay, so 1 over t plus 1 over u minus 1 over t. Okay, now if you repeat this exercise, you're going to get ct minus cs equals 1, cu minus ct. What's wrong with this system? Add the three things on the left, you get 0 equals 3. Okay, so there's no solution. <laughs> there is a way of, uh, of, uh, of solving this problem, which is I use the assumption that the spin one particle is unique. So now if I make these coupling constants here depend on various spin particles, and I call the three-point coupling F, A, B, C, then you will find that there is a way of getting something consistent. And these FABCs, lo and behold, must satisfy an identity. So I'm calling them FABC. They're spin one particles. So it shouldn't take much to, to recognize that these identities is called the Jacobi identity. And you discover Young-Mills theory. Okay? Not only you discover Young-Mills theory, you compute the four-point scattering amplitude. It's a great bonus. If you repeat this exercise for spin two particle. So now you get spin two, so you're gonna get everything squared. You're gonna get one over st squared. And I like, uh-oh, uh, there's s and there's double polling t. But there is a way out. What's the way out? I'm on the s channel, right? So s is zero, I see t squared, but t plus u equals zero when s equals zero. So I can think of this t squared as being t times u. Okay. So that's my only way out. So I see, if I go to spin 2, I'll see s t squared. s t squared. But because I sent s to 0, it's really, I, sh I can interpret it as s t u, OK? Now you go to the t channel, you see the t, so this is in the s channel. In the t channel, you see 1 over t u squared. You go to the u channel, you see 1 over u s squared. And this time, actually, all the residues do work out. If you write the same coupling constant everywhere, you get numerator divided by STU, which is the four graviton scattering amplitude. Okay. The numerator, well, it doesn't matter. It's like a one 
two, uh, maybe th three, four squared, something like this. So all those context terms, those horrendous context terms that I told you about that DeWitt uh, computed, they are taken care of here just by gluing three-point scattering amplitudes. So this, I think, is unbelievable. Okay, It's a kind of crazy result. Somehow you're gluing these uh, three-point scattering amplitudes, and you're getting the results. And somehow it knows about all these context terms conspiring to give you the right answer. It's magic, right? It's a... Uh, well, I invite you, just open the WITS paper and stare at that context term, and then I think you're going to be more impressed by the fact that we already computed the four-point scattering amplitudes. Okay. It's a magical thing. What happens if I go spin up one more time? I get 1 over st cubed. Mm, now, stu squared, I'm done. So any spin greater than two, I can't write something compatible with locality. So go home. Okay? Yeah. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, first of all, why can't what's stopping you from having a constant term in your energy? Ah, you can, but the, the, the constant term will uh, not be the leading, the leading term at low energies. That's all. So th these constraints will only play a role if there are poles in the amplitude. <laughs> Ah, <laughs> if you do it for spin three halves, you and you couple it to gravity, you discover that if there are you know if there are matter fields around, if there is a scalar, the scalar can't be alone. There has to be a spin one half particle, and now if you and then you build something consistent, and then you see can I add two spin three halves particles? And the answer is yes then you can build something consistent. Can I add three of them? Four, five, six, seven, eight. I can all the way to n equals eight supergravity. So you discover n equals eight supergravity if you play this game with spin three halves particles. Okay. So this is done in uh, det If you want to see this in uh, glorious detail, you can look at a paper by uh, Magedi and Rodina from 2013, I think. So they, they, they show that if you have spin three halves particles, you, they do need, the scattering amplitudes do need to uh, be organized in multiplets of sugra, and you discover supergravity. Yeah, question? Uh, I think you'll probably run into trouble, right? I think probably, I, I, I don't know about, I, know, I do know about Velos Wanziger, but uh, maybe we can try to do it. It's not incredibly complicated. We can try to see how, how it will look like offline, but there is, there, there are, there are some funny examples in which uh, you can build some three-point scattering amplitudes in which you have as many brackets upstairs and you have, as you have brackets downstairs. So the limit doesn't quite go to zero, but doesn't quite blow up. It's like finite as you send the momenta to the real sheet. And people write something on the light front that generates these three-point vertices, but then they fail this four-point test. So this was done in this, uh, in this paper here. So if you couple your spinning particles to matter, you discover that they must be coupled in a, for spin one, they must be coupled in a charge conserving way. If they couple to spin two, you discover the equivalence principle. So all of this is given to you by this, by this exercise of playing with three point scattering amplitudes with um, massless particles. And now, what, what I was going to tell you, and I don't have time to, is we are just beginning to learn how this story works in cosmology. Because remember that there are these limits of the four-point 
Remember these limits of the four-point uh, correlator in which you get the centaur objects. You get a mixture of three-point scattering amplitude times three-point correlator because I dragged one of the vertices to very early times and kept the other one fixed. So you can try to do a little bit of Lego, trying to glue these things, impose the sitter symmetry, and you see that only one channel is not enough. You have to go to another channel. You discover the equivalence principle. You discover... Uh, you know, gauge theory and blah, 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 okay? So the same story will repeat itself in cosmology, but in cosmology, remember that I showed you last lecture that there are these funny representations that don't have a flat space analog. These objects that spin two particles that propagate four degrees of freedom. So you can't just uplift a lesson of flat space and, and say something about cosmology. We need to understand these uh, type of constructions in the cosmological setting because then either we build the four-point function of these objects and then that's great it means that there is a theory or we find that it's impossible so it's a no-go result so this is just a will be the sad conclusion but um, it needs to be done there are some no-go results but there is no systematic understanding of these uh, funny representations so that's one one thing, one reason why you'd be interested in these four particle tests. Moreover, it's, it kind of knows about all of these contact diagrams. So that's a pretty fantastic result. So we want to understand how it works in cosmology. So I hope I convinced you in, in these lectures that there is this uh, influx of ideas from you know, the flat space S matrix, from conformal field theory, from the bootstrap, from quantum gravity, in anti-de-sitter space from uh, theoretical cosmology that's just giving us a new handle in understanding this theory of the initial conditions of the universe. And in some sense, all these lectures were about writing 1 over S minus M squared. Okay, something that I can teach you in five minutes in flat space. We spent a few hours doing it here in cosmology because we're not used to the kinematics. We don't quite understand the rules of the game. Okay. So now you can think of any amazing statement about the flat space S matrix and ask yourself, how does it work in cosmology? And the answer is, I don't know. So I invite you to explore this. I think that there's a lot to be done, a lot of uh, fun things to learn. So that's all I have. Thanks for your attention.